Good evening, everyone. I would like to call the regular meetings of the Housing Successor, Successor Agency, and City Council to order. City Clerk, roll call, please. Councilmember Martin. Here. Councilmember Mora. Here. Councilmember Sardo. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Zamora. Here. And Mayor Rodriguez. Here. Thank you. I would like to call upon Councilmember Martin to give the invocation. Please stand. Please bow your heads. Our Heavenly Father, we give thanks tonight for the privilege of meeting together to deliberate on matters affecting our city. We ask for your guidance in our efforts to work for the betterment of our community. In your name we pray. Amen. I would like to call upon Salem Gardley from Jersey Elementary School to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Oh, before you, before you step down, could you please tell us your grade and what sports and or hobbies you're in? And you could face the audience and just tell everybody what grade you're in and if you have any sports or hobbies that you'd like us to know about. Yes? I am Salem and I am in kindergarten and I play basketball. Yes. Good job, Salem. Yes. All right. Item number five, public comments are now open. Anyone joining us through Zoom can use the raise hand function if you wish to make a public comment on any item on the agenda or not on the agenda. The city clerk will see if you have raised your hand through the Zoom application. For those that are here to make a public comment, I'm sorry, the city clerk will see if you have raised your hand through the Zoom application. For those that are here to make a public comment in person, you will have an opportunity once the city clerk announces your name. You will have three minutes. City clerk, do we have any members of the public that wish to speak today? Madam Mayor, we have four speakers today. We have three in person, one via Zoom. The first one is Enrique Valenzuela. Thank you. Hi, Enrique. Hello. You can come up to the podium. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you for having me over. And on behalf of the uh, mayor of Navajoa, uh, Mario Martin Martinez, uh, he sent a letter uh, to you, mayor, and uh, all your staff, and also the, the, uh, the committee of Santa Fe Springs to invite you guys to this September 16 for Fiestas Patrias in Navajoa. He will be uh, uh, really happy to have you guys over there. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invite. Next, we have Eddie Perry. You can speak now. Or did you want to speak on his behalf? Well, he's at soccer practice with his kids. I mean, he 
Do you want to come up to the podium? That way people on Zoom can hear you. Joe Rounds. I live on Gridley Road in Santa Fe Springs. Um, my son-in-law really wanted to come speak because item number 11 is uh, something that was, he's part of item number 11. He's had a history with the tree policy that's going on. But I'm here to speak um, and chat with you, everyone, to bring my opinion on item number 11. First of all, um, I think the trees on Maidstone should come down. I've always believed that. Um, I don't uh, disagree with that, but I know that the city has a tree policy. And when I was on the council, I went over to the residents, I talked to them, I walked with them, I looked at their problem. I totally agreed with them. But when I came back to city hall and talked to the city manager, the director of public works and the tree arborist, they all said, Bill, we have a tree policy. We don't cut down dead trees. We don't cut down dead trees. So I was surprised. I mean, living trees, excuse me. We don't cut down living trees. Um, I saw what was listed on the agenda of the reasons why the trees should come down. Well, I'll speak on behalf of my son-in-law right now. His house, he has a, one of the biggest oak trees on the block. Um, he purchased his house within several months after installing new floors. He had three stoppages in his sewer lateral, and he attributed that to tree roots. So the tree was scheduled to be removed. Um, there was a sign posted on his, on his front yard no parking. And lo and behold, the morning of the tree was going to be cut down, the sign was removed. No tree was not cut down. Later, I found out, or we found out, um, that Council Member Zamora had went to the city manager and said, no, the tree can't come down. So, okay, what's the process? And I stepped out of it. I never was involved with this process at all anyway. Being on the council, Eddie did it all on his own. Well, I'm not going to have enough time to even get half of what I want to talk about. But um, so he went through the planning commission, or he went through the public works department, applied. It was denied. His his uh, his uh, he could uh, go to the planning commission and appeal the decision. He did that. He came. He sh he showed pictures. He sh that the roots were intruding into his sewer line. But after everything was said and done, all the departments. Got, you know, I thank you. Yeah, I didn't thank even get that. to the the good part of it, but um, well, I really you. think you need to re look at this agenda item. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Our next speaker is via Zoom, Monica. Unmute. Hot. Huh? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, I'm also with, hi Bill, I'm, I'm on, regarding agenda 11. I too had issues with my tree. Uh, they refused me um, and it's all the same issues as these trees. So I wanna know who approved this, um, you know, and how, 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 how did it go through when I had so many problems with my tree and it was denied? I want to know who approved this and how it got through so fast. That's ridiculous. I've lived here forever and I can't get rid of this tree. Um, also, I know many people who try to get rid of their tree and they have the same issues. They were all denied because the trees are alive. So I want to know who approved this and how do I get my tree removed this quickly like they did? I, and if possible, I'd like to give my remaining time to Bill to finish his remarks. So stop my time, please. Do you have your next speaker? Madam Mayor, just to be clear, you want me to announce the next speaker? 
The next speaker is Witron. Hi, good evening. My name is uh, Irma Witron, and I'm speaking on several items. And um, please uh, correct me if I'm speaking out of order on these items. Um, the first item I'd like to speak on is regarding um, in support of the item number 12, which is under a new business for on-call support uh, engineering services for residential streets. Um, in the past, uh, during public hearings that I've attended as a resident, I know uh, residents have, have said that, you know, that's an area that was damaged by the freeway um, and, and widening and, and trucks. Uh, work trucks, and so um, I'm glad to see that this item is moving forward. With regard to item number 11, uh, I'm not super familiar with the tree policy of the city, but just in hearing um, and reading online um, comments from, from residents that are concerned about perhaps the, um, the tree policy being applied on different streets in different ways, um, I think the city council should maybe as a follow-up item, revisit the tree policy and see if it's still relevant today. Um, maybe there needs to be, um, you know, ways for people to request exceptions and criteria where they can request uh, tree removals and consideration, maybe with the assistance uh, of a, a city arborist. Um, you know, as trees mature, the root systems get bigger and um, maybe what was relevant 10 or 15 years ago isn't relevant today in 2022. So I think like everything, all city policies need to be revisited every so often. And the last comment that I have is regarding item number 13, the Little Lake Park evaluation unfinished business. Um, I just my general comment on this is that it's very difficult to provide public comment at the beginning of a meeting when the items haven't been presented or discussed by city council. It's very hard as a resident to provide uh, feedback on without hearing the report from staff or even hearing what city council um, thinks about the item. So I, I just would like there to be additional uh, public input on that item. And maybe perhaps the city council can also think about um, not necessarily taking all public comment at the beginning, maybe finding a way where residents can hear what the city staff has to say um, and provide public comment that would be more relevant at that time. Um, thank you for your time. That concludes my comments. Madam Mayor, that concludes our speakers for today. Okay, I wanna thank all of our speakers for their input. And now we'll move along. Uh, I will now close public comments and move on to the next item. Item number six, presentations, introduction of the new Santa Fe Springs Department of Fire Rescue Firefighter Candidates. I would like to call upon Battalion Chief Chad Van Mitteren. Madam Mayor, I'm gonna take that for Chad tonight. Oh, sure, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and this is Chief Hayward. Good evening, everybody, Madam Mayor and Council. It's good to be back up here. I'm pleased to present two of our new firefighter candidates to the council and city tonight. I'd just like to briefly tell you a little bit about each of them. Uh, but before I talk about them, I'd like to briefly explain the path that's brought them to us and what their first probationary year will entail. Each of them have been through a certified fire academy consisting of seven weeks of intense training that covered subjects such as emergency medical training, hazardous materials awareness, urban search and rescue, along with the usual hose, ladders, and firefighting tactics and strategies. These individuals have gone beyond that training and put themselves through additional rescue training. And one in the group has attended paramedic school and is currently a certified paramedic with Los Angeles County. These gentlemen have worked extremely hard, excelled in the written examination, physical standards testing, and an interview process to get to this point today. Once hired, each of them went through a six week introductory Santa Fe Springs Academy to become acclimated to the way our department functions and our specific equipment. They are on a one year probationary period where each day is lined out with training specific to each engine in each district within the city. They have a notebook of sign offs that must be completed to pass probation, along with passing a six month and one year performance evaluation test. 
You may notice that they're not wearing a badge at this point. The badge is earned and at the end of probation, it will be our pleasure to present it to one of their family members to pin on their chest and present them with their new protective gear. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce your two new probationary firefighters, starting with Andrew Kong. Candidate Andrew Kong is originally from La Habra, California and currently lives in Irvine. He attended Orange Lutheran High School. He's married to his wife, Janelle, and has two children, Jackson, who's three, and the week he started here had his second named Sky. So we know he's got his hands full for sure. Andrew attend, attended the University of California, Irvine, where he obtained his bachelor's degree in sociology. He graduated from Rio Hondo Fire Academy and is currently finishing up his Associate of Arts in Fire Technology there. After Fire Academy, uh, Andrew honed a lot of his postgraduate skills here as an auxiliary firefighter with the city, where he volunteered one full shift per week with our members, and that's work on a 24 hour schedule. His hobbies and interests include snowboarding, guitar, bodyboarding, learning new sports with his little one Jackson, and spending time with family and friends. Andrew also grew up speaking Korean and is working towards other language as he has a good, uh, has a, uh, I can't even get the words out. He's got a great teacher and his wife, Janelle. Um, she's, fluent, uh, she's fluent in Spanish, Japanese, and Korean. She's an ER nurse. Some of his future goals are to pass probation, continue to learn and grow, seek future promotions, and become a great asset to the department. So with that, we're pleased to present Andrew Kong. Thank you, GVR. It's a pleasure to meet everyone. Uh, nice to meet everyone. And I'm thrilled for this opportunity to be a part of such a great department uh, and the members of the department and be able to continue to learn and grow as much as I can and continue to serve community to the best of my ability. So thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Next up, I'd like to introduce Jason Amaya. Jason grew up with his mother and father in a firefighter family next door here in Norwalk. He's the youngest of three with an older sister and a brother. He graduated from John Glenn High School and graduated in 2017. If he looks vaguely familiar, his older brother works here at Fire Rescue and Jason was an explorer with the department and also an auxiliary firefighter with the department after graduating Rio Hondo's Fire Academy. His drive is outstanding. He performed excellent in the recruitment process and in one of his examples of just his drive and dedication towards the fire service, he's already graduated and is a Los Angeles County fire paramedic, which is a huge challenge for anybody. Some of his hobbies include hiking, camping, biking, along with attending sporting events and spending time with family and friends. His future goals include successfully passing probation, finishing up his bachelor's degree, and working on squad 841 as one of our own paramedics here in the city. We're pleased to welcome Jason Amaya. Uh, hello, uh, I just wanna thank the city and the department for giving me this opportunity uh, to be a firefighter here for Santa Fe Springs. Uh, I'm looking forward to the uh, many years to come, uh, being able to grow as a firefighter in this career and uh, serving the city of Santa Fe Springs. Thank you. Thank you and welcome aboard. Okay, we're moving on to 6B, introduction of Department of Community Services, newly promoted library services manager, Deborah Rea. I would like to call upon the Director of Community Services, Maricela Balderas. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I would like to introduce to you uh, our internal promotion of Deborah Rea as our new library services manager. Uh, Deborah started her career with Santa Fe Springs in January of 2015 as the Librarian 3. Prior to coming to work for Santa Fe Springs, Deborah uh, worked for the cities of Yorba Linda and with LA County, working at the AC Bilbrew, Norwalk, and Carson libraries. Prior to that, Deborah managed several large law libraries and worked as a researcher in the corporate planning department uh, at an oil company. 
Deborah graduated from Canyon High School in Anaheim. She received her bachelor's degree from Cal State Fullerton in English and her master's degree in library science from UCLA. Deborah's hobbies include reading, knitting, and spending time with her two dogs and her two cats. She's a great doggy and cat mommy. Uh, Deborah's future goals are expanding the city's library services in the community and adding new and engaging programming in the library and also at the Willie Gordon Learning Center and Carriage Barn. Congratulations, Deborah. Deborah, did you want to say a few words? <laughs> I would like to thank you for the opportunity to be the library manager. I'm really excited about some of the things we have coming and um, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. And now we have 6C proclaiming June 15th, 2022 as World Elder Abuse Awareness Day in the city of Santa Fe Springs. I would like to call upon Community Services Supervisor, Jose Carrillo. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, Mayor Pro Temp, members of the council and Madam City Clerk. Uh, older Americans make invaluable contributions to our families, our communities, and our nation every day. But for far too many, the sacred promise of aging with dignity in America is broken by unethical incidents of abuse, neglect, or exploitation. On World Abuse uh, Awareness Day, Americans of all ages join the international community to raise awareness and help bring an end to elder abuse. Elder abuse can take on many forms, including financial, emotional, physical, or sexual, as well as exploitation and neglect. Every year, one in 10 Americans aged 60 and older experience abuse. And for every one case of elder abuse comes the attention of authorities. And it is estimated that every 20, that, uh, that 23 cases are never brought to light. These attacks are shameful and deeply un-American. On June 15th, 2022, World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, the city of Santa Fe Springs will stand with all older Americans and elderly people around the world who are victims of elder abuse, neglect, and financial exploitation. And we recommit ourselves to protecting every senior's right to live their, their golden years with dignity and respect. On June 15th at the Gus Velasco Community Center, we will promote World Elder Abuse Awareness Day by providing older adults with information, fact sheets, and contact information on elder abuse. Uh, we've invited members of the Senior Advisory Committee to receive the, the proclamation. Thank you. And I would like to call upon the City Clerk to read the proclamation, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Whereas the City of Santa Fe Springs recognizes the importance of taking action to raise awareness, prevent, and address elder abuse. And whereas the City of Santa Fe Springs recognizes that older adults deserve to be treated with respect, and dignity to enable them to serve as leaders, mentors, volunteers, and vital participating members of our communities. And now therefore be it resolved that the City Council of the City of Santa Fe Springs hereby proclaim June 15, 2022 as World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. Thank you. And can I have the Senior Advisory Committee to come up to receive the proclamation?
All right, we're moving on to item number seven, housing successor agenda. We have one consent item. Is there a motion for the approval of item number seven? I'll move. Any opposed? Yeah. Okay. City Clerk, roll call vote, please. Councilmember Martin? Yes. Councilmember Mora? Aye. Councilmember Sarno? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Zamora? Aye. And Mayor Rodriguez? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Item number eight, successor ag agency agenda. We have one consent item. Second. City Clerk, roll call vote, please. Councilmember Martin? Aye. Councilmember Mora? Aye. Councilmember Sarno? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Zamora? Aye. Mayor Rodriguez? Aye. Motion passes. Aye. Thank you. Item number nine, city council agenda. We have eight consent items, A through H. For item 9E, staff has provided us with a revised resolution with a revision to the property ownership. Is there a motion for the approval of the city council consent agenda, including the revised resolution for item 8E? I move. Second. City clerk, roll call, please. Need clarification on the second, please. I heard two seconds. John Mora? John, yes. Councilmember Martin? Aye. Councilmember Mora? Aye. Councilmember Sarno? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Zamora? Aye. Mayor Rodriguez? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. New business, item number 10, introduction and discussion of city's proposed fiscal year 2022-2023 budget. I would like to call on city manager, Ray Cruz. Yes, honorable mayor and council members, staff tonight will be introducing the city of Santa Fe Springs fiscal year 22-23 budget. In order to bring this budget forward tonight, it took many hours of preparation between department directors and their managers, supervisors, and line staff. It then took many hours of the finance team to analyze the submitted information so it could be in distilled into a form that could be reviewed by the city council. After the city council provided feedback on the draft budget at their budget subcommittee meetings, the finance team developed further refinements so it, so it there could be further discussed tonight by the entire council body and the public at large. The city is very fortunate that it has thrived the last two plus years economically. This is mainly due to the fact that many of the city's businesses remained open during the pandemic because they were considered essential. Furthermore, through prudent and strategic actions, the city council positioned our city to be in a place where our revenues and budget are very strong. To these, due to these very wise financial decisions the last 10 years, it now allows the city council to continue to place resources in strategic locations that improve the city's public safety and infrastructure. At this time, I would like to introduce the city's senior budget analyst, Alvaro Castellon, to walk the city council through the highlights of the draft budget. After he's done with his presentation, we both are available for questions. Alvaro, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Ray. Uh, good evening, Mayor and City Council. It is an absolute honor to, to present to you the proposed fiscal year 2022-23 operating budget, which as Ray mentioned, is a culmination of several months worth of work and meetings to get to this point. Um, we've prepared a couple of slides here and I'll try to be as concise as possible. First, we wanted to provide a brief update on where we're anticipating any of the current fiscal year. As you know, our sales tax base was generally unaffected by the pandemic and we are anticipating generating the highest sales tax ever recorded this year at about $34 million. All of our other general revenues are expected to be within budget or higher than our budget estimates for this year, which is why we are projecting a general fund revenues to be at $67 million. On the expenditure side, departments have achieved um, operational savings in their budget, and we are projecting department, departmental expenditures at 56 million, non-recurring expenses at 1.2 million, and 2.8 million in transfers to the UUT CIP fund. Uh, so a combination of strong revenues and savings across the, all departments has led us to project a range of six to eight million dollars in the general fund surplus at year end. Uh, once this fiscal year's financials are completed, we will come back to the council with a recommendation on how to allocate the surplus. Uh, similarly, we're we projecting a surplus of approximately a million dollars in the water utility fund. We are recommending any surplus from the water fund be allocated to the water CIP fund. 
as public work staff mentioned a couple of weeks ago at the study session, we're, in, we're anticipating using about a million dollars every year um, from generated surplus to be able to carry out the capital improvement plan for water related projects. But again, once the fiscal year ends and our financials are completed, we will bring it back to the council for approval. Shifting gears a little bit to the upcoming fiscal year, as you are all well aware, uh, this budget is being prepared under, under an increased economic uncertainty as Russia's war on Ukraine and supply, supply chain disruptions are causing record rates of inflation uh, coming in as high as 8.5%. Uh, we have seen the impacts not just in the, in the increase in cost of living, but also increases in cost for the delivery of city programs and services to our community. Fortunately, as we see it today, um, our city revenue sources are stable and will provide the necessary resources needed to carry out all of the programs and services included in this year's budget. Uh, we will remain cautious, however, and continue to monitor our revenues throughout the fiscal year to make sure that our revenues, especially our sales tax revenue, are, are trending favorably. With, with that in mind, we're, we are projecting an overall revenue increase of about 7% or um, $4.7 million in comparison to last year. Sales tax and Measure Y, which are the two largest um, slices of the pie chart there, represent over two thirds of our revenues. Both are anticipated to increase by about $3.3 million in combined with about a seven to eight and 8% 8 growth respectively. Further increases are expected for the UUT, about $200,000 increase, and the UUT represents about 9% of our general fund revenues. Um, property, we're also projecting property tax increase of 100,000. Property tax represents about 6% of our general fund revenues. And we are also anticipating revenue increases in other general revenues for this upcoming fiscal year. On the expenditure side, we're projecting an overall increase of 9.6% or about $5.9 million in comparison to last year. This increase is due to several items including funding the 3% COLA increase for the second year under the current labor agreements with all three labor associations, um, additional PERS unfunded liability and normal cost contributions and other labor increases such as health insurance increases, step increases and um, increases to our retiree med medical insurance. On the left-hand side there, you'll see the general fund budget broken down by department, similar to most cities, Public safety represents the largest portion of our budget with over 50% of it allocated for fire and police services. This allocation is about roughly $35.4 million combined for both departments. 16% um, or 10.7 million is dedicated to the development and maintenance of our infrastructure, which is provided by our public works department. 11% or seven and a half million uh, goes to community services, which is comprised of Parks and Rec, Family and Human Services, and the library. And the balance, which is about 14 million or 20% of the budget is allocated to finance, general government, planning, non-recurring, and the $2.8 million transfer from the general fund to the UUT CIP fund. In addition to the labor costs that I just mentioned, there are other items embedded in the proposed budget, such as $2.4 million for the replacement of six city vehicles, including two much needed fire engines, a 1.4 million increase to our annual unfunded liability payment, which is now an annual payment of 11.6 million in comparison to last year's 10.2 million. There's also 900,000 in there for 22 position adjustments, including five new full-time positions, eight upgrades and nine new part-time positions. There's $500,000 embedded in the budget for additional police and or traffic officers, uh, $400,000 for needed IT upgrades and enhancements, including an IT security assessment, $250,000 for our share of the cost for the police worn body cameras, and $200,000 for various improvements throughout our public facilities. And there's also other inflation driven increases to, to supplies, contracts, and utilities throughout the budget. So taking all of this into account, we are proposing $69.6 .6 million in general fund revenues and 67.7 million in general fund expenditures for the upcoming fiscal year. With the revenues and expenditures we are proposing, there is a budget surplus of $1.9 million. If the council may recall, we were anticipating a $3.3 million surplus initially. However, this was prior to incorporating the new positions that I just mentioned, which 
cost about 900,000 and prior to adding the additional 500,000 for the police officers. Um, these are the only two changes we have made that impact the budget surplus since our budget subcommittee meetings. There are also a couple of items for council consideration at the closed session meeting tonight that can impact the surplus amount we're currently working with. But as of now, there is a projected $1.9 million budget surplus. And I know it's a little tough to see, but um, I mentioned earlier that there's 22 position adjustments that are being proposed in the budget. These again include five new full-time positions, eight upgrades, nine new part-time position positions. And there's also one title change being proposed. And we've listed all, all those positions on this slide for your consideration. And lastly, for the water utility fund, we're proposing $17 million in revenue which is in alignment with the water rate study, uh, with the water rate study estimates. The revenues that have been generated from previous rate increases so far have been within estimated amounts. However, the water use restrictions due to the drought may potentially impact some of the actual revenue we receive this fiscal year. But again, we will closely monitor um, the revenues for the water fund. And on the expenditure side, we're proposing $16.5 million and we're proposing to allocate the $500,000 budget surplus into the water CIP fund. Next steps, our next step in the budget process is to essentially incorporate any further direction from the city council from today and present it for adoption at the June 21st meeting. And then we start the new fiscal year on July 1. And that will conclude my report and I'm available for any questions the council may have. Thank you. Thank you. And are there any uh, questions or any questions from our council? Um, just a quick comment. Thank you, Alvaro. I'm um, having the meetings, um, explaining everything one on one makes a big difference in us understanding the budget. Um, I'm happy that we are having a surplus and we are thinking ahead. So thank you and your, your staff for that. All right. Thank you. Council. Thank you. And as, uh, is there any direction from staff? Anything else? Okay, well, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, we're moving on to item number 11, Maidstone Avenue, evaluation of Parkway Pine Trees. I would like to call on Director of Public Works, Noen Negrete. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Council, uh, so you had before you um, at the last meeting uh, during the public comment, residents from Maidstone uh, came and um, wanted us to take a look at a further evaluation of their pine trees uh, on Maidstone. Uh, we've done that. Uh, there's essentially 27 homes on this stretch south of Florence Avenue. Uh, then it hooks and joins back to Roston Avenue. Uh, on the on this street, that's about approximately 30 feet wide uh, with 12 foot parkways on each side of the street. We found 23 mature pine trees in the parkways uh, on both sides of the street. Um, on April 30th, we received a survey from the Maidstone residents. Um, their survey was done uh, to be a survey monkey, and they were able to get 20 responses with 19 out of the 20 advocating for the removal of their trees. On Wednesday, May 25th, uh, from approximately 515 to 635, uh, staff conducted uh, our own survey uh, of Maidstone and we were uh, able to get uh, 22 respondents. Uh, of those, 13 were homeowners, uh, nine are renters. And of those 22, 20 uh, were in favor of removal. Two were not in favor of removal of the trees. Uh, we also asked if they would be in favor of a replacement tree as long as it wasn't a pine tree. And 17 uh, of those 22, which is 77%, uh, were in favor of a replacement tree. Um, we did put in your packet uh, a diagram of this um, shown on here. Uh, the blue are the people uh, that were in favor of removing the tree. Uh, the red um, is the nose and the grays were the people that uh, did not open their door or told us to go away or were not home, a combination of all those. Uh, but we do feel comfortable that uh, we did get a good cross section um, of responses with those 22 of the 27 homes. We did try to go back um, a follow-up day during the daytime uh, to those five homes, and uh, still we did not get any response. 
so there's uh, various complaints. Um, hold on, stay back here. Uh, various complaints uh, during the survey. We did ask for the reasons why they asked for the removal of the tree. Uh, uh, pine needles uh, falling in the parkway and their front yard, uh, requiring constant maintenance, uh, sweeping of the sidewalk, uh, their roof as well, getting the pine trees, uh, clogging in their drains and in their backyards. Uh, a couple of homes had pools and complained of having to empty out their filters uh, faster than they would like to. Um, Multiple complaints regarding uh, tree roots infiltrating their uh, sewer laterals with several residents letting us know that they replaced their sewer lateral uh, because of the roots of the trees was uh, their main complaint. Um, sap dropping from the trees uh, was also another major, uh, especially sticking on their vehicles. We did observe uh, several vehicles do have car covers um, or uh, we also observed people not wanting to park on the street because of not wanting to park under the tree. Uh, we did observe um, raised sidewalk, displaced curb and gutter in several areas. Uh, there was also uplifted asphalt in the street uh, due to the tree roots. Uh, we also observed areas where there was standing water or there was evidence of standing water uh, due to the uplift in the curb and gutter, uh, the street wasn't able to drain properly. Those were our observations. So let's talk about the tree policy that we have here. Um, so our tree policy is to protect healthy uh, trees. That's what we do. Uh, if a tree is healthy, uh, we don't remove those trees. Our major criteria for removal of a tree is either dead, diseased, or dying. If it meets those three, then it does get removed. Unfortunately, uh, these trees, like many other trees that we get asked uh, to look at, uh, don't meet this criteria. There are subsequent uh, criteria we also look at. Uh, other factors. Um, it could be a high risk of failure of a tree coming down. Uh, we did not witness that in any of the trees. Uh, potential structure damage to a building. Uh, we did not observe that as well. Uh, there could be potential sight distance where the tree is um, not letting a vehicle see around a corner um, for another car coming. Uh, that was also not witnessed. Uh, the main issue here really is uh, property maintenance and property damage uh, caused by the pine trees. And uh, the residents um, complaint was that they do experience a poor quality of life uh, due to the upkeep and property damage associated with those pine trees. So this is a good time uh, to look at this issue uh, because we're also looking at uh, rehabilitating the street at this time. If you recall, uh, we do have a contract in design uh, all the streets south of Florence, uh, bound essentially by the railroad tracks and the five freeway. Uh, we're looking at rehabbing all those streets. Um, this, this would be a good time if you're wanting to do something with those trees uh, to, to either um, remove them, have them replaced. Uh, but the project can be done without removing them. You just have to go repair all that curb and gutter and repair that sidewalk. Okay. Um, we've looked at this process before. Uh, the last residential street where we had a, a similar issue was on Parkmead from Pioneer to Jersey. Um, similar damage to the pavement, curb gutter, sidewalk, and drainage issues. Um, I would say that was a more extreme case than this case, uh, but they do have um, similar patterns. You asked me to come back and uh, talk about cost. So we did uh, get a cost from West Coast Arborist. I know in the fiscal impact, we put between 45 and 50,000. Uh, we were able to get a price from West Coast Arborist for the removal of those 23 trees would be just under $45,000. Um, you could, if you wanted to replace them, you could put it as part of the project, the street project that I referred to earlier, um, and they would probably hire somebody else and they would mark it up, right? They would probably do like a 15% markup, so we'd pay more than that, uh, but you could also do that as well. If you wanted to replace the trees, uh, we're depending on the tree species and the size, we estimate um, if you wanted to replace the 27 trees, uh, we'd probably put a tree in each property, uh, anywhere in the range between 10 to $15,000. And uh, if we do want West Coast to do it, um, then we would have to issue them a change order because it would exceed our contract amount with them, the limit that you set um, of $275,000. Uh, so we would need direction in doing that as well, if we went that direction. So I will stop there. 
Uh, I do have pictures of the street. Uh, they range roughly anywhere between uh, 45 to 60 feet. Uh, some are in excess of 60 feet. Uh, here's just a, a few pictures. You can see uh, some damage done on your left uh, into the asphalt in the street. You can see on the right uh, the displacement of the curb and gutter. Um, on your right, this one is a sidewalk. Uh, on the left, you can see the pine needles uh, do accumulate uh, on this street. And with that, I'll stop there. And I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. I have a question, um, Madam Mayor. Um, I know that the residents, when they talked the last time, they had brought up about um, their insurance when it comes to their housing insurance. I noticed that you didn't put that in the report. So is that something that, you know, is it, um, I know that you said yes, um, but um, is it something that we can put in or add in to make sure that everybody understands that um, when we have housing insurance where we live, um, they actually, you know, what, um, they're actually, uh, it's actually much, uh, I think it, you guys were saying it was more difficult for you guys to even get any homeowners insurance and other things like that. So I think that actually plays a major role in our decision and what we're doing because we're, we're talking about someone's house, someone's livelihood. If a tree does fall on it and, you know, one of those trees goes down and the tree falls on, it's going to be a massive repair that the homeowner has to, has to pay. So, you know, not having that homeowner's insurance to cover it is detrimental to their livelihood. So I just want to make sure that we make that, I uh, just make that statement. Uh, so, no, we did not verify if that was uh, a true statement or not nor do we ask anybody to provide that information. Uh, mm -hmm. If that's something that they want to provide, they can. Uh, that's not something we usually ask for uh, okay. since that's kind of a personal um, information of a resident. Well, I just wanted to be, you know, bring it up just so the record can state. I, I had a question, Noah. Uh, when I talked to you this morning, I asked if there were pictures, but I provided some pictures and I, I'm curious as to why those weren't shown because what I seen is a, is a, understatement of what those pictures are an understatement of what I gave to you of what the residents had showed me that day. So if, and uh, Ray, if you have those pictures, city manager, Ray Cruz, if you have those pictures, I would like them up so that our uh, audience can see just how much, how, how bad this gets on a daily basis, because this looks uh, to me, looks very spotless compared to what I saw. The gutters were, uh, filled with pine needles. Uh, the streets were filled with pine needles. It was uh, just a lot of maintenance for all of our residents. And that's what caught my attention was that it is a, not a way to live every day when you see that. And also they're slippery. When I was walking, it, you know, it's easy to fall because the pine needles are so slippery on the street. So, uh, and, you know, I appreciate all the council at the last meeting seeing and, and letting us know that they want the residents uh, needs and wants so that we could go around to each neighborhood and see what's going on in our uh, streets and our residents concerns so that we can fix these kind of issues. So if you have those pictures, if you don't have the pictures, I can send them to you right now and, and I'd like to have them on the screen. I don't, I don't have them on me. Um, I but, can send them to you. I, I think that uh, you're correct, and we don't dispute the fact that there are a lot of pine needles. But on just the to show yeah. the pictures, that's why I called you this morning to make sure that those pictures would be shown today. These are not uh, uh, the pictures that I gave to Ray. When, when does your street sweeper go by? That was taken the day after. Oh. Uh, and and uh, so I, I guess, um, too, and the thing that we have to look at as a council is just remember that of course, look at the four seasons that we're in. And of course, the, uh, the main one is fall when I when all the pine needles or when do you guys expect the pine needles to fall the most? Anytime there's a good wind. Anytime there's, all right. You can okay. come up to the podium yeah, if you'd uh, like podium. to speak, please. Yeah, we, we would agree as a staff that there are uh, pine needles there every day on a daily basis. No, that's fine. We, it's okay. And we'll, we won't just that, say we'll, that picture is a good day after they've done a good job sweeping the street where they've come by at least four times on one row, just back and forth four times to clean it. 
this happens. We have pine needles all week long. If there's even a slight wind, the street will be full of pine needles. And what's not taken into consideration is we can't see all those parts that are bad. That's why my sister broke her foot. She has a broken foot from stepping in one of those potholes. So it is very dangerous for us to have those pine trees there. And the minute they get wet, forget it. It becomes a whole new problem. We do slip on them. And we do have homeowners that have been threatened to have their homeowner's insurance canceled. The reason they're not here is because they tend to be a little shy and their response is the city's not gonna do anything about it anyway. But we are being threatened with homeowners insurance being canceled because they say it's our responsibility to fix the sidewalk. It's not. Madam Speaker, could you please? Isabel Cervantes. Thank you. And also, uh, Noah, I would like to, the pictures that I sent, I would like them put up there. And I, uh, the last meeting that we had, what was your recommendations? Because you said they need to come down and no one wants to take down a live tree, but the circumstances of what is happening on that street, what was your response? Yeah, you have to determine extenuating circumstances beyond our uh, tree policy. The tree policy won't allow for just debris to be fall down. But I said that I will not plant any new pine trees in a residential area. Okay. How about, can I make a comment, please? Oh, yes, go ahead. Thank you. Um, no, there's a couple of things. I, th this Maidstone Street, th these pine trees are horrible. They're horrific. You know, I live with them my whole life. Uh, I had, uh, I have a house on Mill Grove uh, on the other side of Telegraph where Pine, Pioneer and, Tel and Mill Grove and Houghton, they all have the same problem. Uh, I had to put a new roof on uh, top of the, on, on the house because of the pine trees uh, decaying the roof and stuff like that. But this is more than just Maidstone. This is, if we want to rewrite a policy, then let's, talk about rewriting a policy. This is not just Maidstone that we have to fix. There's a, other streets and other trees that people have the same problems in front of their house, that trees make a mess, the root systems and things to that nature. So I, I suggest this is, we're focused on Maidstone, but I think this is a policy that we need to all talk about and rewrite to be able to get these problems eradicated and done for the community and for the people, because Maidstone is not the only street that has these problems. And if we open up this can, every homeowner should be able to take down a tree because of the mess or the roots that it, it is uh, causing in front of their house. So this is a lot bigger problem than just the pine trees. And no, I'll have to disagree with you about you know, the cost because once you take down these trees, you're not talking, you're just talking about shaving the, the stump. What about the existing roots? So you would have to take out all of the grass the same way you did on park need to get all those roots out of the, the grass area in the front of the parkway. And that's another cost. So it's not just taking down the trees. It's, there's gonna be a lot more problems with it. So I think this is a, a little bit bigger than what we're kind of, being explained right now, but I think we have to follow our policy, guys. And if we want to rewrite the policy, then let's rewrite the policy. But it's not fair to the people that have gone through the chain of command and have been told year after year after year, uh, no, we don't take down uh, living trees. So I'm okay. I, I think the pine trees are horrible, but then let's do it for everybody across the board, not just for Maidstone. So you're talking about any tree instead of just pine trees? A any tree. Because the, the pine trees are not the only uh, tree in the city that create a huge mess and uplift our sidewalks and curbing gutters and stuff like that. So I, I just think, you know, because now the next person that hears this meeting, what are they going to tell us? They're going to come and say, well, you guys just did it for Maidstone. 
why don't you do it for me? So I think we need to change our policy to make it so whichever way we figure out what best suits us as a city, but to make it fair for every uh, resident in the city of Santa Fe Springs, not just Maysville. Yes, yes, go ahead. Um, I think we all agree. Um, it's just a little disturbing that as council, this problem has been going on for years. And as a group, we're supposed to make this better for our city. And it's a little upsetting for myself, um, Bill, Joe Angel, Annette, I don't think you were, you were on board yet. I think Jay was, um, that you guys been coming for this for years. And it's very upsetting when I know myself, I know Bill, I know Jay, I know Joe Angel. We've all come to the city manager and say, what's going on? Why can't we fix this? To be honest with you, I feel very disrespected in a way as a council member, because we all here for our residents. That issue has been going on forever. On a personal note, I think I look, I don't have any leadership because they've all come to us before. And I had to tell them no because we had a follow policy. So that doesn't look good as a council, as a whole council, because we've all have heard it, we've all seen it. Not all of a sudden we need it done and it's gonna be done. This is an issue that's been going on for quite some time. We've had Davin Ridge, like JC, there's other streets. There's other streets guaranteed you're gonna find streets on your street and at all of our streets have this issue. If this has been going on so long, why haven't we changed it for the whole city to get fixed? Not just all of a sudden, again, this happens and things need to change now. I feel disrespected as a council member from my staff because we've all been here to change that issue and we get told straight out, no. What's the difference now? Madam I feel that we need to look at all the cities. I mean, there's some cities that we have seniors that I know on Davenrich that they had to move out of their house because they couldn't afford to keep re replacing their windshield. I know for a fact that one time I actually helped, had to help an old lady help her pay for some of her windshield because the city didn't reimburse her. This is on damage, the city didn't reimburse her. Old lady on a fixed income could not fix her windshield. We, I had to do that because we got told no. So I feel that if we do this, yes, Maitland's horrible. I've been down the street, it's horrible. You do slip, you do fall. But I think if we do this, we should do all the cities and you know, do a, do something, you know, make a new protocol, regardless if it's a pine tree, regarding it's one of the trees that do the roots. There's, it's a big thing. This is a big project. I think it should be done across the board, not just one little street. Yeah, and, and, and think, um, I'd like to say, no one said that we just wanted to do Maidstone. The Maidstone residents went to meet the mayor and asked me to go uh, take a tour down their street. So uh, please make no mistake about it. It's just not Maidstone. It was because that was the request of the residents. And uh, that's why I went to go visit them. If another street resident had asked me to do the same, I would have done the same. Uh, I was told that we can amend uh, the Maidstone, uh, the tree policy, that it can be amended. And then we can discuss a permanent amendment. Uh, I was told that by Noet that it is, uh, he's, his recommendation is to take those trees down because it has always, he knew about it. You already knew about the problem when I brought it to you and it had been brought to your attention in the past. So you knew about it. You recommended that the trees should be taken down and what it, they should be taken down when we do this upgrade on the street. And now I'm hearing something different. So it just, uh, I'm astonished because I don't know uh, where, what's going on here. So uh, we, we will have to give a directive today and I don't wanna send these people away uh, feeling hopelessness like they did in, in last time. We, they, we owe it to them, just like Juanita said, we owe it to them to serve our residents and that's why we got voted in was to take care of our residents. Now, how is it gonna look when we tell them, come back, we're gonna do research. You did your research. I don't see, and you know, it's, it's kind of upsetting that those pictures aren't there because that's deceiving and I don't like that, but we will discuss that later. Okay, did you have something yeah, to say? Yeah, Madam Mayor, I, I, I probably at the last meeting misspoke when I said you can change your policy and you, you can, but 
we'd rather not change the policy. I've been doing this for 35 years and I've had similar policies in, in four different cities. And there is, but however, there's exceptions to the policy and exceptions un, under extreme conditions. And you did that in, um, on Park Mead. And back then I think it was assessed that of a scale of 10 on damage to that area, it was like a nine. Here we have about a six. It's similar, but not exactly the same, but it's really up to the council on what the extreme condition is. And maybe this meets that criteria, but we really shouldn't change our policy that we've used for decades in, in many cities because you get a slippery slope about what tree is you know, a healthy uh, tree. And sometimes they're, they're indigenous trees, sometimes they're protected trees. And so you, you've got to be very careful with that. But I do want us to say that we can deal with exceptions and if this council feels this meets the exception with the damage that's going on, I think that's what you probably, I probably should have clarified my last statement because I do know um, two council members stated that we were saying um, you can't change the policy, but we do have exceptions. It is, it's a subtle difference, but it is a difference. Yeah, I, I want to say that I did speak with one of, uh, with a council member and he tried to uh, go into this and they were, he, he was talked to, it was John Moore. He, he uh, tried to fix this and he said that there was the policy and it couldn't be amended. But then when I got into the, uh, the tree uh, tour and I was told that there could be an exception, uh, last council meeting, we said that we're gonna find out the needs and the wants of the residents. This, this is just not a need. Uh, this is, I mean, this is not just a want, this is a need. Uh, Jace Arnold says that this is horrific this is horrible. It's horrific. He's been down there. Juanita said that she's been down there. It's a bad situation. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Zamora said he's been down there. It's a bad situation. So we are, we, we are taking a directive and we're asking before you get started on uh, the project on Maidstone, uh, we need to further discuss what we're going to do about these trees. Because again, no one wants to take down healthy live trees. But in this situation, it's horrific and it's horrible and we need to do something about it. And Mayor, I also have a question. So what happens about the people that don't want their trees taken down? That's number one. And number two, the people that you guys did talk to, Noe, uh, that were renters, they don't have a say because they don't own the house. So you would have to get a hold of the owners of the property to make sure that they are want, willing to take the tree down, number two. And a true cost of what it would take when we do this project, the streets, the sidewalk, uh, the curb and gutter, and the parkways. That We need a true cost. And it's going to be a lot. I, I will guess it's going to be closer to two hundred dollars to $250,000 to do this project, just on Maidstone. And if, also, I'd like to find out about uh, how it was handled on Park Mead. If all of the residents said, yes, they want the trees down, I want to find out how that process was handled so that we could uh, emulate that process with these processes. And if we have to amend the tree policy, then I, I'm, I don't think we can do that today. It's not on the agenda, but maybe at a future agenda, uh, but we need to take uh, some type of directive today to get this information back to us. Well, I'd like to make a, a directive in actually getting the true cost. Um, just like council member Sarno said, and what the the cost of it being. I know that as a case to case, we can actually amend and do this case separately. And, you know, when it comes to additional trees or bulk trees, because this is bulk trees, we're, we're not talking about one tree, we're talking about a, a bulk of a bulk of trees. So if you guys don't mind, I'd like to move this forward and, and make the director. That yeah, we can I make a, a, a comment before we get going? Um, oh, go ahead, John. Yeah, sorry. And am I coming through okay? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You know, no, just one quick question. I know we had the, uh, the cost of the, or the removal of the trees and uh, council member uh, Stoner had stated that that could be potentially more, but it, does that cost reflect uh, also the removal of the roots? No. So to no. answer the question from council member Sarno and, and Zamora and Zamora, uh, the true cost will come when we do the streets, right? So we have a designer working on that now. Uh, that's part of what the change order is on your next item on item number 12, is to examine what those uh, um, scope of work is going to be necessary. to. If you remove the tree, there's removing of the roots, removing of the curb and gutter, how much of that curb and gutter gets removed. 
So that will be addressed when we do the, the um, street project. Uh, we think we have enough money in there uh, to address that. Uh, but if we don't, then we would ask you for more when we come back with that project. At this point, the cost that we're looking at is just to remove those trees, the stump grind, and then just to give you an idea of what it would cost if we were to, if we were to uh, replace those trees. But that replacement cost would also go in the street project. Okay. And the question about Park Mead, uh, it was just over 75% of the people wanted to remove the Park Mead trees. And this was 91? Correct. Um, I have a uh, Mesa suggestion. Um, there are, there are these, tre these, these trees are on Davenridge too. There's some on Miller Grove. Could we just, uh, yeah, through the whole city. Oh, Could we do a survey of the people that do have these trees? Cause it's going to open up. Uh, yeah. It's going to open up a can of worms of other residents. I've been wanting these trees down and it's not happening. So how's that going to look? Why are we doing it? And we all know guarantee hands down. We know how bad mate zone is. We've been there. We've done it. All of us have said we would help you. I mean, I just, I'll be honest with you. I'm upset because I also tried so hard for you guys, as well as the other council members did here. And we kept getting told no. And it's hard because your street is bad. Your street is horrible. Let's not wait to get the other streets as bad as that. Let this be an example. Let's do what we need to do. If that street's what's going to be coming out of it, every other street that has these trees, let's do a survey and let's see all the other pine trees in the city, if they need to be removed. I mean, so, that's just my suggestion of doing the survey also with these. So what you're saying is maybe doing a true cost of, of all pine trees located within our residential areas. Correct. All right. And, so. and, and I know that, I mean, pine trees, and I know this is one situation, but with all the other trees that we have an issue with, um, yeah. guaranteed how many of these homes, I mean, like I said, how many people don't have pine trees and these trees are killing our plumbing, are okay. killing us and people tripping. Last, I think two weeks ago, I just went to know there was an 89 year old man that fell, you know, on one of the streets because of the, it wasn't a pine tree. I don't know what type, of, but it's again, it's a tree that people have said, this is an issue. And because it's alive, we can't remove it. What happens? Somebody ends up falling. So I think we do need to look over that policy on a base to base. But with the pine trees, I think we should do a survey with the ones all over the city and start with that and move forward. And make sure you separate okay. them. Um, just to add what you're saying, Juanita, uh, make sure you separate them in, you know, in, in, in areas, you know, so whatever areas they're located, you know, make sure that's a separate cost. That, you know, eventually we're going to have a total final cost just so we know. And so we don't say, oh, this is a total cost for all pine trees. We want to make sure we know different areas, especially because we are going to be having a project coming up here in the triangle area is uh, what we call um, the Maidstone area. And I think that's a, that's a different case only because eventually we're gonna be going through um, the wear and tear there anyway. So we can actually get a cost reduction just by doing it all at once. It makes it easier for us. You know, I've got a, that's another comment to make. Um, yes, uh, you know, I know that, you know, well, you know, for Noe, you know, he's got his, uh, his plate full. And, you know, he's going based on the ordinance that we have had in place for many, many years. And we did have a comment by one of our residents that, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, ordinances need to be changed. And if the ordinance may not be changed, well, you know, there are exceptions. But what are we really trying to do? So I know that the, this, uh, you know, especially along Main Zone, because that's the, the, the our main uh, problem here. Um, you know, I did a uh, visit uh, Mason about 10 days ago. You know, I spoke to one of the residents, uh, Edward Cadena, uh, a while back, and it was our ordinance that we do not remove a healthy, not dying, mature tree. But some of these, you know, healthy trees can cause uh, issues like, you know, we've all seen. And uh, yeah, and I took a tour. I look at the, the gutters. I saw the sidewalks. I saw things that were lifted. And it, it is definitely a, a burden. That was uh, that was obvious. Um, you know, there was uh, you know, it could also be a health issue because, well, you know, stagnant water that just sits there. Now you got mosquitoes. Mosquitoes carry diseases, and if it's not sprayed properly, you don't have the proper drainage. That could be a problem. Uh, people falling down. People having to worry about uh, their uh, sewer laterals getting clogged. Uh, I think there's one or two homes with pools in them, and you guys have all heard it. So you know, I'm not going to repeat the the comments that they made. But however. And the ordinance is in place. Now, 
you know, obviously this is going to be taxed with a difficult decision, but, you know, as, uh, as council members, you know, there was one thing that had mentioned there that we do not remove healthy trees. And then the, uh, also trees are a benefit to our environment. And they also provide, uh, you know, a nice, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, for residents, you know, to be uh, happy where they're, uh, uh, where they're living. But this is definitely a, a burden. So I think, uh, you know, if we, we do need to look at our, uh, at our ordinance, uh, if it can't be changed, there are exceptions. Um, you know, if these trees have to be removed, which they might be. You know, there's, we have so many different options for trees that are not going to cause this problem to the residents of 40, 50 years from now. And uh, the other trees all over the city, you know, not all the trees are causing damage. You know, some trees are not pine trees that I see roots coming up, you know, up through the sidewalk. And so I think this could be also on a case by case uh, basis. But, you know, we're all here, uh, you know, for our residents uh, to have them benefit from a nice quality of life here at the city. So we need to do what we've got to do to, uh, to make this happen for them. I just have one thing to say before. Noe. Noe, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Noe, how many calls a week do you get for trees to be removed? Uh, calls, I'm not sure, but requests, we probably average anywhere between uh, two to six a month. Well, expect that to probably be about 20 to 30 after this. So there's going to be a lot more people wanting to get their trees taken down. And we have to make sure that we have the right reasons to say no now. So can we give a directive now? So I would like to make a directive in actually getting the true costs of the different pine trees, you know, the locations of all the areas that um, in the residential areas that have pine trees. Um, so we can understand better what the what the cost is going to be in the end for all of us. So then for us, it'd make it a lot easier for this case by case to see what type of decision we need to make there. Are, are, Joanne, are we going to hire an arborist to look at that or, or are we going to do it in house? I mean, I, we have our own arborists and uh, we are, um, um, what is it? We are hiring a groundskeeper. So it's actually taking away work from our arborists. So it actually should be freeing them up to be able to do this. I mean, I think that's, this is why we, we gave that other position, if I'm not mistaken. And this actually helps uh -huh. us out. So should we get somebody from the outside to get it done faster? So have West Coast arborist or have a third party arborist just come in and, and do the evaluation on all the pine trees to help us out with it. It might be a little bit faster. Madam Mayor and Council, I've heard uh, potentially consensus on three different items. One would be to move forward with the steps needed to remove the pine trees on Maidstone as there is a pending project and right. some time constraints relating to that. Um, secondly, there would to ask the staff to survey other residential streets with pine trees. Mm -hmm. That sounds like that could take a little more time and you don't want to hold up this one. So, so what we could do is actually focus on this one first, then let's do that. Let's focus on the Maidstone, uh, the, the triangle area. And then from there, so we can get, and if we need to hire somebody from, you know, an outside party, um, council member Sarnel to actually f help us with the Maidstone, uh, Maidstone project, then let's do that. And then with the other project, we could just have our arborists, you know, um, do the rest of the work uh, um, when it comes to all the other pine trees. Is that okay with you guys? Uh, Rico, so, no, when's the project for the, uh, do we do have a date of when the street and everything's going to be done in the triangle? Do you have a time frame? Yeah, we'd like to start. Uh, yeah. We'd like to start at the, at the beginning of next year. Next year, next year right? Okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure it's still, okay. Yeah. And are we going to do anything for yeah. the policy? What, Jay? Are we gonna do anything about the policy? I was going to say lastly, I heard some con potential consensus to review the tree policy. Yes. Yep. Yes, we gotta review that again. All right, are there any other questions or concerns? We have our directive in place. Thank you, Noe. Thank you, Noe. And thank you, thank residents. You know, thank you. Yes, thank you, residents, yeah. for being here. Mm -hmm. Starts taking so long, though. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on to item number 12 
on-call professional engineering services for the design of residential streets improvements south of Florence Avenue, in parentheses, Orende Road to Ringwood Avenue, approval of task order number three. I would like to call on Director of Public Works, Noe Negrete. Again. Busy. <laughs> okay, thank you, good segue here. Uh, so if you recall, we do have uh, NV5 uh, working on the design uh, of these residential streets. They did turn in their first uh, submittal, 75%. Uh, and we did have some comments to them, and we also noticed that we actually missed some things. Uh, so just, let me see if I can highlight this. So we, we do call it the triangle uh, for a reason. There's Florence, and then that's the railroad track, and then the five. So it kind of makes a triangle. You can see it better on an aerial view. Uh, those are all the streets um, south of Florence that we feel need to be addressed. Um, they were in construction uh, for many years, I think starting in 2015. Uh, those streets got driven on um, by heavy trucks, heavy equipment that they weren't supposed to by Caltrans. Uh, and we were just waiting for the construction to finish. That way we can address the streets. The ones you see in red are a grinding cap. We, we removed the asphalt, put back in new asphalt. The ones in purple were going to be a slurry seal. Um, and what we found is uh, three things. Uh, one is on Maidstone that there was, uh, since we did the 2016 uh, study, that it had, um, did, if we did a, a slurry seal, it just wouldn't work. So we need to go back in and, and do um, more than just a slurry seal. We need to do a grind in a cap. Um, along with that, uh, we left out Longworth Avenue as part of the original scope of work. If you remember when we did the CIP, we also approved that street, but when we did the original scope of work, because it was north of uh, Florence, it got left out. Uh, so we want to add that in at this point so that we can uh, put that as part of this project, since they were also affected by that same construction that was going on. Um, and then lastly, um, the streets that are going to be slurried. Well, let me go back. There you go. The streets that are going to be slurried, which are the purple ones. Uh, we want the uh, designer to do is do what they call an aerial, aerial uh, topo. That way they can go evaluate all the sidewalk and all the curb and gutter. Uh, per our initial scope of work, we just told them to do the slurry, but we wanted them to do also the uh, concrete improvements at the same time. Uh, so that got missed on the streets that were the slurry seal. So what we're asking here now is the streets that are in green, the Longworth Maidstone, uh, Longworth to be added to it, Maidstone to be changed uh, to a grinding cap, and then the purple streets, uh, Flowline, Bueller, uh, Lakeland and uh, Ringwood uh, to have an uh, additional aerial topo so we can pick up all those curb gutter sidewalk driveways that need to be fixed. Uh, so we're here today because it exceeds my authority to give them a change order. Uh, the initial uh, amount was $85,000 or just a little over 85,000. Um, their change order for this is 485. Uh, so what we're asking you is to accept the proposal, uh, request an additional appropriation of 485 from the UUT into this project, and then authorize me to execute this task order uh, with NV5. Happy to take questions. I have a question. So with what we just talked about right now, are we gonna have to appropriate more money to, to this item um, because- at, at this point, we think we have enough money in the budget to address that. Okay. Uh, but when we get to the 90% plans, uh, they do give us a cost estimate to uh, look at that. So we, we, we will evaluate if we need more money or if we still have enough money to do that. All right, cool. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Noe. Thanks. Okay. Uh, are there any other further discussion on item number 12? All right. Is, uh, can I get a motion for the approval of item number 12? I'll move. I'll second. City Clerk, roll call vote, please. Councilmember Morgan? Aye. Councilmember Mora? Aye. Councilmember Sarno? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Zamora? Aye. Mayor Rodriguez? Aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Now, unfinished business, item number 13, Little Lake Park evaluation of tournament field operation. I would like to call on Director of Public Works, Noe Negrete. <laughs> Go ahead, have your water. As you can see, we've been a little bit busy the last couple of weeks. Um, we have before you is a Little Lake Park uh, evaluation of uh, tournament field operation. Um, previously last year, we received a proposal from ZT uh, Baseball. Uh, that was back in September of 2021. Um, 
and we've had a lot of back and forth with them, uh, emails, phone calls, uh, text messages. Uh, just so, just a quick recap, uh, Little Lake Park is a shared park between Norwalk and Santa Fe Springs. Uh, Norwalk operates the programming Monday through Thursday. Santa Fe Springs does it uh, Friday through Sunday. Uh, we have a little bit different park hours, uh, but I think we have a 53% usage of time and they got 47% of time, uh, even though they have more, more days. Um, so in your packet, um, I'm just going to highlight some of the things here. We went into a lot more detail in the packet um, in terms of the pros and cons. Uh, but we did, like I said, we did have a lot of back and forth with ZT. They revised their proposal. Uh, I want to thank my staff, also Parks and Recreation staff, uh, for providing a majority of the comments here. Um, and we did have meetings uh, with ZT, ZT as well to try to clarify some of the things. Unfortunately, some things still remain unclarified. Uh, so that's why you're going to see in your in the uh, in the in your packet and in this presentation, we're going to talk about pros, which are the good things, the benefits, the cons, which are the things that we don't like, uh, other considerations, um, and unknown. So even after all of this, there's still th still some things that um, are not clear in terms of the information that they provide. So again, we're talking about setting up um, um, an agreement uh, in this case with ZT Baseball. Uh, to run uh, four fields, four baseball fields. They would fence that area off, uh, and they would run that for tournament-style uh, or travel-style baseball, uh, where they would charge uh, people an entrance to come in. They would have a concession stand. They would also uh, make money, and uh, we would have to enter into some kind of an agreement. So one of the pros is they're estimating, per their estimates, and we have not, uh, uh, haven't hired an, an auditor or an accountant, to confirm this, but we can only go by what they're in their proposal. They're estimating this to be uh, $8.4 million spent in the local economy if they were to run uh, this program for 45 uh, weekends. That's what we're looking at. Uh, they'll maintain the fields, right? They'll put a fence around it. So then we won't have to maintain the fields anymore. So that's uh, a, a benefit to us. We won't have to spend our time uh, to maintain the fields uh, nor to prep the fields uh, for any uh, activities that are on the fields. Uh, in their proposal, they talk about improvements to the restrooms. They talked about offering uh, free summer camps for the community a couple times a year. They also talked about changing uh, the fields to artificial turf and also uh, trying to get uh, local businesses uh, more business uh, by using them as their vendors. Okay, for the cons now, the things that we really didn't uh, uh, appreciate, so to say, is the term of the, uh, the lease. So... They originally looked at a 20-year lease. Uh, we asked them to uh, give us some different options. Obviously, the longer the lease, the better the revenue. So uh, we looked at a 10-year lease. They would give us 1% uh, revenue, which we'll come back to what that equates to. Uh, if they went to a 15-year lease, they'd be, giving, uh, they'd be willing to go to a 2% of the revenue. And if we went to a 20-year lease, they'd be willing to give us 3% of their revenue. Um, one of the biggest issues that we're finding is would be uh, inadequate parking at this park. Uh, as you know, we're um, in design, getting ready to go out to bid uh, to do both of those parking lots. Uh, but even with the additional spaces that we're talking about, it's still what we don't think would be adequate uh, to be able to have um, parking for all the teams that are available. So we're looking at four fields. Uh, but as you know, there's overlap, right? So if there's four fields, that's eight teams playing at a time. But the other teams, the other eight teams will be coming before that game is over. Uh, it's not like they're going to, you know, come right when the people leave the parking and they're going to come in. There'll be some overlap. So we do have concerns about that. Uh, we do have a proposal from ZT to address that, which I'll show you in one of the slides. Uh, current sports leagues would be forced to relocate to another park. Uh, so we do have uh, current tenants there, um, football, uh, fast pitch. That's their home they would have to find somewhere else to go play because the park would not be available for them. Another one would be uh, right now, it's really a multi-use uh, park, uh, how it's uh, laid out with the, the parks uh, fields facing inwards. You're only able to play uh, baseball, softball, but you're also able to play soccer, football, or any other activity that you want to do out there because it's an open field. If you were to do what they want to do is put the fields uh, on the inside facing out and then put a fence around it, then that would eliminate all other uses of that field. It would just be uh, limited to baseball, softball. Um, and 
if we did a 10 year lease, which um, we think we should, we would feel more comfortable with because the first time we're doing this, you want to probably go into a shorter term, but even at a 10 year lease, that 1%, uh, we're looking at about $184,000 of revenue. Uh, once you take away um, a little bit of the maintenance costs, it would probably equate to what we get in revenue now from the city of Norwalk. So from the city of Norwalk, roughly uh, a good number to say is we get about $125,000 in shared costs that they pay for since we share the park and about $30,000 in pro programming costs that they uh, give us as well. So a little, a little over $150,000. So at the 1%, you're really talking about the same revenue. So it's not, a, it's not anything additional to what we already get. Okay, so the unknowns, like I said, we went back and forth. Um, they're, they're located in Houston. Um, so a lot of emails back and forth. Uh, they revised their proposal. But there's still a couple things that we really didn't get clarity on from them is they say that they're going to do the restroom improvements, um, but there wasn't a lot of details. So at that park, there's two restrooms. Um, what does that mean? Are you going to just paint it? Is that going to be a restroom improvement? Or are you gutting it and putting in new uh, toilets, partitions, and sinks? That's unclear in terms of what they um, are, are saying they're going to do. The ball field layout as well. Um, I'll show you the current. It's kind of hard to see, but the current, this is the current layout. Uh, what we did as a staff is that we just put uh, 330 feet, uh, roughly is what an outfield fence would be for baseball. And it overlaps, right, currently. That's why we don't have uh, a lot of uh, four fields at the same time, because left fielder and right fielder could be, you know, right next to each other. Uh, and that's not a good thing. What they decided to do is a little bit hard to see, but see in the, go in the middle and face outward. Um, so one of the things we couldn't confirm was the dimensions of the fields. It's too small to read. Um, we couldn't get that from them. One bigger field, three smaller fields. Uh, so we don't know what age group that is. We weren't able to find that. Uh, also, we had some issues with uh, balls going towards the apartment complex. Uh, we weren't sure if there was additional netting or fencing there to keep that from happening because we could see that being a potential issue uh, with that layout. Um, again, these are potential things to happen, uh, need for more trash services and more, more custodial services. If you're having that amount of people go to the park for 45 weekends, uh, we would, uh, intuitively think there's going to be more trash and more custodial services needed as well as police activity. Um, it's not clear. They weren't clear, uh, in terms of they were saying if they if they were going to sell alcohol or not, that was not clarified by them. Um, but even if there's not with that amount of people, um, we do think there's probably going to be a need for more police activity there to make sure uh, level and cooler heads prevail um, at the outcomes of games. Other considerations, uh, as, as I said, we do share this park with the city of Norwalk. Uh, we have not approached them because we uh, felt that we'd be better to get your opinion if we want to move this forward. If we want to move this forward, then we would approach them. Um, we did it uh, from a staff level. There was some staff conversation at the Parks and Recs level. Um, and at least their staff was not favorable on this because they would lose the field usage and they would lose usage of the park essentially. Um, and another thing that didn't come up, but if they do decide to go, if we, if we decide to go forward and they agree, I'm probably sure they'd want to split that revenue with us, right? We, they wouldn't let us keep all the revenue. There'd probably be some splitting. So if we had that 184, now that's less than $100,000 um, if we do split it. And again, this is not ZT baseball, so I want to, I'm going to make sure that's uh, clear. We're not saying ZT baseball is like this, uh, but in um, our research with other cities that have done something similar to this, like a Field of Dreams, uh, those plans didn't quite materialize uh, how things were envisioned. Uh, worst case scenario, uh, they had problems like uh, defaulting on payments or going into bankruptcy or having to sell those facilities. Again, that's not ZT baseball. Okay? We, don't, we don't have any information that they're doing that. Uh, but doing our due diligence, we did ask other cities that have gone through this, um, and they did say that there was some issues on the back end. And then most importantly, um, the biggest unknown is really from the cost standpoint, um, we were able to narrow down uh, their commitment was about $2 million. So all those things that I told you that they were going to do, we had a long conversation with them saying, I don't know if you know how much things cost in California versus Houston but that didn't add up to us. So we were telling them this costs more closer to $10 million, even with all the unknowns that we that they, you know, we're thinking it's closer to 10, it could be more, but we're saying, hey, it's closer to 10, you're saying two, who pays for the rest? 
Their answer was they're willing to negotiate that. So again, not a lot of clarity. Uh, we like to operate on, on more uh, clear pictures uh, when we go forward with projects. But at this point, uh, that was the best they were able to give us. And uh, with that, I will stop there and uh, happy to take questions. I don't feel comfortable at all even going further on this. No. It seems like there's so much uncertainty. I mean, it's going to affect us that much. I mean, my personal opinion, I don't know if the rest of the council, it's there's so much unknown. Do we really want to put ourselves in that situation? And I know the last time we talked, I mean, we, the price was 19 million. And I know that it's still 1%. And I was just like, you know, and they were talking about the cost of how they were going to build a field. And, you know, and, but yet they didn't have the finances. If they were going to make so much money, you know, in, in what their what their profit margin was, it was like, why don't they build the field themselves? But they're not even talking about that. But I know that in the past I was against this and, you know, I'm still against this. So I hope that we can finally close this chapter and stop wasting money on, you know, on our staff, on our staff time. So hopefully if um, council member um, Martin, if that's a directive, I mean, I'm willing to second that directive of just closing this chapter and moving on and, you know, allowing our residents and to continue to enjoy those fields. You know, we have soccer there, we have so um, softball there, um, we have um, football there, we have basketball there. I mean, we have so much that happens there. We have St. Pius Church that uses that parking lot when they have service, mass, or, or any other um, events there. And it just makes it real difficult. I mean, here we're, we're giving up green space, you know, I mean, and it doesn't make sense uh, just to do that and put every other resident, you know, not, ha not giving them the opportunity to utilize that, that space. So I hope that we can close this chapter now. Uh, do we have any other council that would like to make some comments? John or Jay? No, let's just, like John just said, let's just move on from this chapter. It didn't, didn't work out. And I don't know why we wasted this long to, to get the, the uh, half the answers. So. Obviously, it didn't work. Yeah, and also, if I can, Jay, just to let um, you know, I think this is a good time that I think too, where staff need to realize when we do give a directive. I mean, please recognize the directive that we're if we're all against it and we were against it. You know, even if it's four or three, it's still a directive. Um, here, it's all five. You know, I know we haven't heard from John, but still, it's just something that we have to realize that we don't need to keep coming back and waste anyone's time just with a topic, just because, and I know Juanita, you know, had mentioned earlier about, you know, about uh, the Maidstone and not being heard. And this is a thing that, you know, this is where we're, you know, where we're giving a directive and hopefully this time you guys do listen to it, you know, when we're talking about staff. And I think just in general, staff need to take better notes or pay better attention. I mean, I'm not trying to knock you guys, but you guys have to understand I do appreciate all that you do, Ivy, because you think I think you and Janet take the best notes, not just to call you guys out, but still um, you have to understand that you guys have to realize once we close something, uh, let's just close it instead of wasting a lot more staff time. Yes, I agreed. I didn't feel comfortable with this. I spoke to Noah this morning and uh, told him exactly what our uh, my peers at the dais have said. So, so are there any more, John? Did you have something to say? Yeah, no, just real quickly, and uh, Noah, thank you so much for that uh, brief summary and, you know, the comparison. I know that, you know, if we were going to do this, you say more comfortable with a 10-year rather than a uh, 20-year uh, lease, the income is not going to be a major, major, uh, you know, it's not going to be a, a make it or break it deal. And you're right, there's too many things that were not clarified. Uh, the the I think he got cut off. Okay. Good All right. Me. So our, I, we got our directive and now we're going to uh, move on to item number 14. Thank you, Noe. Thank you to the staff that worked so hard on uh, getting us, providing us with all oh, this information. Oh, yeah. John, sorry, I think I there? lost you guys for, okay. <laughs> yeah. No, I just wanted, uh, you know, first of all, you know, um, I think you heard what I was just thinking of a brief summary and it's not going to make a major difference, you know, going with the lease that we're more comfortable with, you know, cons are great. Uh, I'm sorry, the pros are fantastic, cons are good, and then too many unknowns. So, yeah, I think we should uh, yeah, move on with this one. Thank you, John. Thank you. 
All right, we're gonna move on to item number 14, city managers and executive team reports. I would like to call upon city manager, Ray Cruz. Yes, honorable mayor and council members, uh, through the support and encouragement of the entire city council, I developed the concept of Santa Fe Springs University. Santa Fe Springs University was developed to improve the city's training and employee development programs. Improved career development programs and better training is in the best interest in order to develop its own employees so they can be be ready when career advancement opportunities arise. Most of the city's training opportunities in the past have come from the city's insurance authority, human resources, law firm, professional associations, or in-service training. Furthermore, these training opportunities are usually only offered once a year and during the workday hours. As one of the key programs under the umbrella of Santa Fe Springs University was to find a training platform that could be available to our employees on numerous subjects 24 hours a day. Through a lot of research by city's municipal affairs manager, Mirabel Garcia, she found the ideal training platform, platform that our employees can start using, and it's called Talent LMS. Once the agreement is finalized, employees can start taking advantage of Talent LMS training by the end of June. At this time, I'd like to bring up Ms. Garcia so she can walk the council through the new training platform and how it operates. Mirabel. All right, good evening. Um... Mayor and council members, as Ray sta stated, we are finalizing an agreement between the city and Talent LMS. Um, here we go. Um, LMS stands for Learning Management System. We will be able to connect from anywhere in the world with instructors, whether in real time or through recorded sessions to provide training to develop our employees for career advancement opportunities when they arise, which makes it more convenient to learn at our own pace and without having to register or drive to a location. At the same time, we will have access to online training material, which includes courses, guides, quizzes, videos, et cetera, at any time. The benefits of LMS, one, we save on training cost, update content quickly, engage and motivate learners, train on the go, track results, and promote a culture of continuous learning. A few months ago, we sent out a city survey asking a few questions. And here's an example of three questions asked along with the responses. Um, for question one, what types of software skills and training would benefit you or your peers within your work unit? And the um, top three responses are uh, Microsoft Office programs, graphic design, and social media platforms. Question two, um, what types of general and professional skills and training would benefit you or your peers within your work unit? The responses are customer service skills, time, stress management, business writing, professional email writing. Another question asked in the survey was, are there any other types of training not listed above that would benefit you or your peers? The responses are as follows, public speaking, hazardous materials, dealing with difficult people, emotional intelligence, marketing, economic development strategies, effective communication, investigation, emergency management, and laws of arrest. As you can see, we have a wide variety of topics and we wanted to find a program to fit everyone's needs. So after interviewing and researching other companies, we have decided to try Talent LMS. Um, Talent LMS offers over 500 courses and these that you see are just a handful of what is offered. What also makes this program unique is that it is cus customizable to fit our needs. For example, if you are in um, recreation and want to learn about accounting, um, classes are available for you. All you need to do is log into the platform with your unique access code that will be sent out to every employee soon. Um, you can view the library courses, take the course, and if you don't complete, no problem, you can pick up wherever you left off. Once you complete a course, there's a short quiz at the end, and we will be notified of your completion and a certificate will be sent to you and your employee file. Um, with that, we look forward to improving the city's training and employee development programs. Thank you, Maribel. Now at this time, I'd like to bring up uh, Director of Public Works, Noe Negrete. Okay, thank you. Just a couple of things to report on. Uh, it's the end of the year. We're trying to close out uh, some projects. Um, a lot of facility projects as well. Uh, so one thing I uh, wanted to show, or actually four things. Wanted to, first thing is 
behind the library parking lot, uh, the lights were upgraded to an LED. Uh, as you can see on the left, uh, that was the old uh, shoebox. And you can see on the right is the new LED. Uh, you can really see a difference at nighttime. The next slide, please. Uh, there's the before and after pictures uh, of the lighting difference. Um, so we're, we're going to continue to look at areas where we can do an in-house um, upgrade. Um, continue to work with our staff to see where we can evaluate areas that need to improve lighting where we can do it in-house. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Town Center Hall, uh, on the right, uh, the uh, floor was uh, recently polished in, in the uh, social hall, as well as uh, new flooring in the kitchen at, uh, for the social hall to your left. Next slide. And then we had uh, new uh, flooring uh, over at the women's restroom at the municipal services yard. And then lastly, uh, last week, uh, Thursday, next slide, please. Uh, we did the groundbreaking event uh, for the Rosecrans Marquardt Grade Separation Project. Uh, I want to thank everybody who attended um, the council. Uh, Mayor Rodriguez was able to uh, speak at the event. Um, Councilman Mora and Martin were also able to attend. Thank you. Uh, even though we're not the lead on this project, uh, we, we're partnering with Metro. Uh, they're really relying on us to uh, make a lot of the, of, of the uh, big project decisions since the project is in our city. Uh, when this is done, it'll be the largest capital investment in our city of over $156 million. Next slide, please. And uh, we're off and running. Uh, we'll be uh, keeping uh, council posted on when we actually start the construction. Uh, essentially, the bridge will be constructed parallel to Rosecrans. So right where we're standing is actually where the new bridge will be. Uh, Rosecrans will be open until the new bridge is, is uh, constructed, and then we'll flip it over. Uh, this will be a three-year project. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Noe. That's a fantastic project. Um, I'd like to bring Director Planning Wayne Morrell. He's uh, remote because he was feeling a little ill, so we want to make sure he wasn't around us. So, Wayne. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council, audience, staff. I would like to call upon my associate planner. Jimmy Wong, who would give most of the presentation today. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'd like to pro provide a status report on the Santa Fe Spring uh, Accessory Dooring Unit, also known as ADU Project. Um, in 2021, last year, the city applied and was selected by Southern California Association of Government, SCAD, to receive a grant from the Regional Early Action Pro Program. The objective of the program is to provide technical assistance related to the ADU. Um, the goal from the program is to provide um, developable, including ADU brochure, handbook, calculator, fact sheet, and prototype design. These tools will help the resident when they consider constructing an ADU. SCAD have um, selected Wilson Associate as the consultant for this project and staff will be working with them closely for those developable. As part of the project, staff and the consultant will be uh, conducting two workshops for ADU workshop on June 23rd and July 6th. Um, flyer will be available outside. If anyone interested, please take one and use the QR code for uh, RSVP. In addition to that, um, staff and the consultant will be conducting a survey for any existing homeowner who are going through this process for any feedback so we can improve the process. And that concludes my update for the ADU project. Yes, thank you, Jimmy. Appreciate it. So, after a two-year hiatus, ICSC Las Vegas was back. Myself and my assistant director, Kwong, attended along with Council Member John Moore. And this is a boot. And this is a picture of us in front of our boot. It was very in my mind, successful, unlike prior years where it was three full day or two and a half day. This was one and a half and the crowd wasn't as much as previous years. 
but we were able to meet with quite a number of potential developers, businesses for the city, which we are following up on. As a matter of fact, just today, I had a meeting with, with some individuals that we met in Las Vegas. Two of them flew in from New York just to meet with us to look at some city-owned property. This can take a while before you realize success, but we have been successful. ICS, ICSC was responsible for the Jersey Mikes, who started at the Santa Fe Springs Promenade, and they were so successful that they opened another store at the Gateway Plaza. We also, the vision of the downtown that we hope to create, with Westland Real Estate Group. That was the result of a meeting in Las Vegas at ICSC. And of course, we have the Sonics, which was also the result of meeting at ICSC in Los Angeles. So from that standpoint, we believe going there every year has been successful and has resulted in benefits to the city. I'm sure Councilmember Mora will report out on his visit, but all in all, it was very successful. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne and Jimmy. Now I'd like to bring up Director of Police Services, Dino Torres. Can you put this slide up, please? Uh, good evening, Mayor. Members of the council have some sad news to report. This past weekend, we received notification from Chief Barr that Whittier PD Officer Linnell Whitfield, who joined the department in October of last year, was killed in an off-duty traffic collision in the city of Linwood on Saturday. Officer Linnell had served two years as Los Angeles County Deputy Sheriff prior to joining the Whittier PD. He was described as a bright and kind young man, full of energy and desire to help others. In the very short time, Linnell developed a strong bond with his fellow police officers and with the communities that he enjoyed serving each day, a testament to his character, commitment, and friendly personality. He truly loved and enjoyed being a police officer. Linnell was 25 years old. I, had, I, I didn't know Linnell. Um, I had the opportunity to go on um, Instagram and look at social media. Uh, there were several thousand uh, posts, and many of those were very touching because uh, he had the opportunity to interact with people in a very positive way um, and it reflected in those comments. Our thoughts and prayers are with Linnell's family, his many law enforcement partners and friends, and the communities he protected. Thank you. Thank you, Dino. I'd like to bring up Fire Chief Brent Hayward. Thank you. Good evening again. Um, our condolences to the Whittier PD family, Linnell, his family. Um, we're wearing our Bad shrouds in honor of him in your department. If there's anything anybody needs, please reach out. Just wanted to give the council a quick update on an issue that we had here at uh, our headquarters at uh, 11300 Greenstone on a power failure that I emailed you uh, the other day. If I could get the first slide. <clears throat> what you're looking at on the left-hand side is uh, Greenstone and our headquarters fire station. Uh, the lower half of the building is the excuse me, suppression side. The upper half is the administrative side. On uh, Sunday evening, we had received emails from Edison that they were gonna be doing some preventative maintenance work that evening. Uh, the next morning, uh, as we came into the administration side, we realized that the generator was running the backup generator that was put in about eight years ago on a CIP project and everything was working properly. It provides a minimal amount of uh, power so that the suppression individuals can, can respond, but there was more of an issue to it. Thanks to Noe, Kevin, Johnny Chavaria, and everybody who came out that morning, we realized we had a bigger problem on our hands than what, uh, what it appeared. Um, an Edison individual was contacted. Um, Johnny and his crew, we ended up seeing a circuit that was blown out on the street. So we called Southern California Edison. They sent out a troubleman and a crew they tried to re-energize that line and the bomb sound that went off rocked the street. Uh, we had a problem with an underground line that you see in yellow. The 
that runs to a transformer in the back near that same generator. Uh, the generator that you see is on the right-hand side doing its job. Um, they tried to re-energize it a couple times and realized that the lines were uh, frayed and destroyed. They could not pull lines. They could not replace lines. They were going to replace a whole new transformer on that right-hand side in the circle. So if we could get the next slide. Edison came in, they brought in a uh, bigger portable generator. If you look on the upper left, that transformer is gone. Uh, everything is completely operational today. So department heads will be having our uh, department head meeting tomorrow still at headquarters in the training room. Um, but as I was leaving, people are still working there. Uh, they're bringing in a brand new transformer. They're having a difficult time trenching underneath that property to bring in those new lines. So they've had crews there for a day and a half. Uh, they're estimating completion possibly tonight between uh, 12 uh, and 2 a.m. But if it does not get done, they will continue to have multiple crews there until that's accomplished because they know the importance of that building. But anyway, I just wanted to bring you up on that uh, information. Hopefully we'll have some better news tonight and uh, I'll let you know first thing in the morning. That concludes my report. Thank you, Chief. And I'd like to bring up Director of Community Services, Maricela Barreras. Thank you, Ray. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and members of the Council. I have a couple of items to share with you this evening. Our Community Services Department, we hosted the annual in-service staff training last Friday, June the 3rd at the Activity Center. The training was attended by 85 staff from uh, the three divisions, the Library, Family and Human Services, and Parks and Recreation. Some of the topics that were discussed included the importance of customer service, conflict resolution, the importance of work in municipal government, and how passion plays an important role in the delivery of services. The theme was colleges and universities, and our staff were allowed to wear their alumni apparel or their favorite college or university attire. I wanna thank Mayor Rodriguez, Council Member Martin, Council Member Mora, and City Manager Ray for spending their morning with us and delivering inspiring words to our community services staff. Here's a video recapping and highlighting the event. Library's first Friday event was held on June 3rd, and it featured a captivating performance by Saki Flamenco. Our guests clapped, cheered, and they danced as flamenco dancers were accompanied by an acoustic guitarist. Uh, the guests were also invited on stage to get up and dance. 
All of the children also received a free book of their choice. Uh, everyone's looking forward to our next uh, Energizing First Friday uh, performance, which will occur in October. And here's a short video recapping the performance. Then on Saturday, June 4th, our families and children were able to go back in time to the early days of the pioneers. The Pioneer Living Day uh, took place at Heritage Park with approximately 200 participants. They were able to enjoy games, interactive experiences like panning for gold, uh, arrowhead uh, making, blacksmithing, and rope making, as well as uh, crafts through the decades to celebrate the history of fun. I want to thank um, Mayor Rodriguez and Mayor Potem Zamora for attending the event. Here's a short video highlighting the event. Show the, uh, the 2022 uh, concert and movie series at Heritage Park starts this Friday, June the 10th, with a concert featuring No Doubt. It's a band that provides the experience and energy of a live No Doubt and Glenn Stefani concert with nostalgic vi uh, uh, visuals and props. Then on Friday, June the 17th, the movie Encanto will be screened. The summer series will uh, alternate between the concert and a movie every Friday through August the 5th, excluding the 4th of July weekend. Our concerts will begin at 7 p.m. with Fashion Friday Boutique in collaboration with the Abigail Barraza Foundation. Our movies will begin at 8.15. We'll have food available for purchase. And if you want further information, our residents can call Heritage Park. Next item. Um, also, uh, on May the 27th, in preparation for uh, the concert and movie series, the Parks and Rangers, they spent the day training on the proper setup and teardown of the new 45-foot movie screen and sound system. You can show this. Um, here are some photos of the park rangers learning how to properly set up and store the screen. The large screen will be set up on the south lawn at Heritage Park, and staff is excited for the uh, new equipment that will enhance the movie experience. I want to thank City Council for the appropriation of this equipment that was part of fiscal year 2021-22. Uh, and then my last item is uh, also this Friday, June 10th, uh, the Family and Human Services Division will be hosting the Hawaiian Luau Senior Dance at the Gus Velasco Neighborhood Center from 9 in the morning to 12 noon. 
We're inviting all our seniors in the community to come out and join the island experience and dress in their favorite Hawaiian attire. The fee is $10 and it includes a catered lunch and some cool refreshments. For more information, you can contact the Gus Velasco Neighborhood Center. Uh, and that concludes my reports. Thank you. Thank you, Maricela. Madam Mayor, that ends our executive team reports. All right, thank you. And we're moving on to item number 15, appointments to boards, committees, and commissions. Uh, Council Member Martin. Thank you. Council Member Mora. None at this time. Thank you. Council Member Sarno. None at this time. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Zamora. None tonight. And I don't have any. Thank you. So now we're moving to item 16, council comments. Council Member Mora. Council Member Mora, are you on? Oh, sorry. A little bit of a technical difficulty here. Sure. Uh, yes, um, good evening, everybody. Uh, and as uh, Wayne had mentioned, I did have the privilege to attend the ICSC convention uh, with Wayne and Kwong um, on the 21st of this month. And um, I saw firsthand how our planning department works. And these two gentlemen are the best. They represent our planning department uh, completely. And uh, we should be proud to have them on our team. Um, every time I, I left the booth to go, as I went in search for a grocery store, uh, working on that one, uh, I came back and we always had developers you know, at the booth. They were always talking uh, and speaking with developers. So I think, uh, as Wayne had said, I think it was um, pretty successful. Uh, they did get to meet many, many people. And I think uh, the overall convention was a, a, a complete uh, success. Um, and also to, uh, to my council members, uh, you know, being on council comes naturally with its own set of challenges. And I know that in the past, you know, we've been working together for quite some time, but you know, we always have agreed to disagree. And um, that's what makes a true council work. And I think if it comes, uh, if we're unclear on one of our colleagues' actions, let's just ask. Because I think if we, I want us to come together united as a council for the betterment of our residents, city and our community. So working together, you know, we're gonna accomplish so many things. Um, I also had the pleasure of attending the Rosecrans and um, uh, Marquardt Great Separation uh, with uh, Annette and Juanita. And that was, uh, that was fantastic. I think it's gonna be a great, uh, um, uh, it's, it's a great project and I'm looking forward to the completion of that one. And also on, um, on a sad note, you know, I did hear that, you know, one of our delivery drivers uh, that came to the yard, uh, Mr. Arnold Holden, uh, passed away as he was uh, making a delivery. And I appreciate so much the actions of Paul Martinez, Vanessa Ponce, and Johnny Chavria who were there, you know, as this uh, gentleman, you know, uh, uh, took his last breaths. Uh, Paul Martinez was quick to act and ask him, who do we, you want us to call? He said his wife, he made it happen. And at least you know, he was able to hear the voice of his wife uh, you know, before he passed. Also, you know, our fire department did everything they possibly could you know, to save this man's life. But uh, unfortunately, you know, he did pass. But, you know, this is just a, um, uh, uh, the representation of the quality of people that we have working for the city. So to you three and our fire department, uh, you know, uh, uh, my appreciation. Okay, congratulations to our fire rescues, uh, Andrew and Jason, and also uh, Deborah Raya on your promotion. Uh, I just like to end with my condolences to the Holden family and also the, uh, Juan, the Newton family, my deepest condolences on your loss, and also, also for Officer Linnell Whitfield. That is all I have, and good evening, everybody. Thank you. And now we have Council Member Martin. Uh, first and foremost, with your PD, our condolences. It's we're, we're a small family here, so it hits home. And like Chief said, our doors, our hearts, Anything for you guys, we'll always be there for you guys. So please um, share that with your, your officers. Um, Geeky, thank you for coming. Um, we have such a good uh, relationship with, with Sister Cities. It's, we go way back and it was great. It's, I appreciate and, and honored that you actually came to invite us over there. Hopefully we'll be able to make it, um, make more memories, um, bring that connection again. And thank you. Please let them know that we are very honored that you came. Please tell uh, Martin, thank you so much. Um, the lights, Noe, the lights do make a big difference. Um, now with my puppies and me walking, 
that lights make a big difference. So thank you so much. Um, orientation, we were over there and it was great to see all these new kids so excited. It seemed like there's so many of them. So it's gonna be great to see all the new faces in the park and stuff. So the program seemed really cool what was going on. So thank you for that. Um, making it short and sweet, um, just happy Father's Day. Um, we won't be here till after. So please, all you fathers out there, happy Father's Day out there and any moms, single moms being out there, Happy Father's Day, too. So um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We have Council Member Sarno. All right, guys. I'm gonna, I'll keep it really short. Um, first, my condolences to the Whittier PD family and the fallen officer. Um, sad day uh, for, for any person to lose their life. Uh, just want to congratulate all the uh, kids graduating today, tomorrow. Uh, this week, another school year has gone by. Um, hopefully, we have a lot of bright new college bound job career uh, um, residents in our community. So, but uh, just everybody stay safe and uh, have a good night and happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Thank you. Thank you. And Mayor Pro Tem Zamora. Um, also, I, I do too want to echo, um, you know, uh, the loss of a, a Whittier PD officer, Linnell Whitfield. I mean, I mean, I know we call it Whittier PD, but it's also Santa Fe Springs PD. Um, you know, we do share it. And also, you know, I know we're talking about Happy Father's Day and, you know, some of us don't have fathers here and, you know, we just got to be grateful. Um, make sure you do hug your father, hug a loved one um, that, that represents a guardian or, or, the, or a fatherhood. I know that um, Kwong and Laura uh, in our planning department, they lost, um, they lost their father. So I just want to um, actually send my condolences to them and um, whatever we can do through the city to support our, our staff and, um, you know, just let us know. Um, also to congratulate all the graduates and all those who are promoting um, from either fifth grade to, to middle school and, you know, kindergarten to first grade. Um, eighth grade uh, freshmen and also high school to college. So uh, congratulations with that. And also um, just on a little note, I know we keep talking about the pool on the aquatic center. So um, there's a, and you know, so in talking about the pool there, you know, I was just asking to, somebody had made a request um, and actually I kind of thought the request, um, we just had Memorial Day weekend where some of us get to enjoy a barbecue and others don't have that luxury because, um, you know, they lost a loved one. And, um, you know, um, so the request is to actually name the pool. Um, if we can name the pool, the Paul T. Nakamura Aquatic Center um, in the future. So when that gets built, if us as council can name it, um, the Paul T. Nakamura pool, um, you know, I can't take credit for the idea. The idea was a great idea. And uh, the idea actually came from a resident, um, Blake Carter. So, um, hopefully in the future, once that pool gets done, we can um, name it in, in honor of, of, you know, your son, um, um, Yoko and Paul. So just to let you know, and hopefully, yeah, you know, we can make that happen. Um, just a little note of Paul. Uh, he actually worked for our city. Uh, he was a, a lifeguard and also uh, he went to the military. And of course, in the line of, in the line of duty, um, um, he was killed. So he went to Santa Fe High School. He's a resident. Uh, he loved this city, and, and it's the least we can do is, is, you know, be able to recognize him that day with his name, you know, always known on that pool. So hopefully we can make that happen. I know we're not there yet. <laughs> if you guys could see what I see right now, um, Yoko's at, um, the mom's actually crying in the audience. So um, once we get there, you know, we'll, we'll see. So other than that, it's a, it's a place that you know, you guys can always attend besides the little memorial we have outside and, and always remember, um, you know, once again, um, happy Father's Day to everybody up here. John Mora, I know you guys are not here, but happy Father's Day. Jay Sarno, happy Father's Day. Um, Juanita, I know you're a father to your two, your, your two so um, happy Father's Day. Um, you know, so other than that, um, I know Annette, everyone else um, plays a role. Um, you know, I play a role to my brother who has special needs. So sometimes it almost feels like I am his, <laughs> like, it, like I am his, uh, his dad. But either way, I just want to ask for a hedge of protection. And may God always bless the fathers out there who, who take on the role as being a father. 
And I commend you guys for always taking up that, you know, um, taking up that time and effort because being a dad is takes hard work. And for those of you who take the time to take your kids and, you know, to, whether it be softball, whether it be baseball, travel, you name it. I mean, literally, I applaud all you guys that continue being who you are because we are lacking fathers in this in this time. Um, we do lack that discipline and love. And so make sure you guys always remember that discipline, discipline and love should always co coincide. And, you know, may justice always be served. So you guys take care. God bless and have a good night. Thank you very much. That was great. And uh, I agree with the uh, Nakamura is that that's a great idea. So I just wanted to say that. And uh, if you need tissue, we have tissue up here. We can bring it to you. You're so sweet. Uh, I just wanted to say we've been very busy over here. We, uh, The city has been having so many programs. I'm so happy because I get to attend all, the, we, we all get to attend all the programs. And, you know, sometimes we have to pick and choose, but, uh, but I try and go to everything that I can possibly go to and, you know, carry a full-time job and then be, a, be the mayor of Santa Fe Springs, which is very important to me. But I just wanted to uh, pay my respects for our Whitt Whittier PD fallen officer, uh, Whitfield. I, uh, I saw the email, and it's, a, it's tragic. And just, you know, if you could go back and tell, uh, tell Whittier PD and all your staff that our condolences, if there's anything that we can do, we're here for you. And I also wanted to uh, congratulate our fire and rescue, rescue, Andrew and Jason. So, uh, so proud. One of them, he looked like he was a teenager. So they're getting younger and younger. <laughs> and also, I, we had so many things going on. The Pilgrim's Day it was a wonderful, wonderful Saturday, beautiful day. And uh, I saw our Mayor Pro Tem Zamora passing out uh, Play-Doh, asked him if I could have some for my grandson, but he only gave me one. But, but anyway, at least I, he has some at home. But it was a beautiful day of dancing and crafts and musical chairs and a, a, a food truck. The, the food was delicious. And a lot of residents, uh, the, the people making quilts and just uh, anything. They were making rope. It's really interesting to go over there. I wanted to thank our, our new staff that we just had met in the, the training, too, because we just told them, please come up to us, tell us your names. We want to get to know you. And they, all of the new staff were there uh, from the training that we had had. So I was really happy to see uh, all of them and shake their hand and get to know them uh, by uh, their names. Also, I went to the Rotary. Uh, I went to go visit the Rotarians with their dinner. Kathy Fink, thank you so much for sending that invite to us. The Rotarians had a dinner for the students of St. Paul and Santa Fe High School. Uh, they had gone camping, and it was a, a training for them, a learning experience. And the kids uh, got up and said their testimonials, and they had such a great time and very passionate. And uh, they said they didn't want to leave. They, the kids that they met that day, uh, they felt like they had known for years. So it was uh, very nice, and I want to thank you for inviting uh, all of us up there. It was uh, I had a really good time. I also went upstairs and, and talked to the Parks and Rec and, met up with Noah. He was giving a training session to the Parks and Rec. So we were, I was just all over the place, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And I had a lot of fun. Uh, the Rosecrans and Marquardt separation uh, bridge, that was, you know, that's going to save a lot of lives and that's going to prevent accidents. And we are in the business of saving lives. Public safety is number one. So I just wanted to make sure that you know that we are there to make sure that public safety uh, our police officers are there, our firefighters are there, and all of our staff to make sure that you're safe, we're safe, and if there's anything else that we can do, just let us know. Your ideas are very important to us. Your concerns are very important to us, and that's why we're trying to do everything that we can do. We may not have been able to do it in the past, but you know what? That's the past. Uh, things change, and we can get on, and we can move forward, and we can get things done. Uh, I wanted to thank Enrique for being here today and thank you for inviting us. That is so special that you came all the way over here. I heard that you live in, is it Hesper? Temecula. Thank you so much. You got a long ride home. And you know, you're always in. Oh, okay, okay. You know that you're always invited to our, we have a Fiesta Patrias and we hope to see you and uh, the, our, the mayor and all of our guests that normally come every year. We hope that we can extend the invitation to you and see you there. Okay, and 
Thank you so much. And I want to wish everybody here a happy Father's Day. I know that, uh, you know, I've seen you dads out there. I, it, it's amazing. I see you with your toddlers. I go to Pretend City, Adventure City, Candyland with um, Thomas and I go with our, our grandbaby and Priscilla and Jonathan. And it amazes me that the, the guys have the babies right here with their little contraption going on. They have the kids, so they're walking the kids, because back in my day, you know, it was different. The, the women did most of that kind of stuff, and, and the men were, they went out and worked, and now we got the men that are taking um, the baby maternity leave and spending time, you know, one-to-ones and um, bonding with their children, and I, I love that, and I see the men having more interaction with the children, and it's beautiful, and I, I know that it's a, a tough job. I want to thank all of our fathers, and I want to thank my husband, Thomas, because my grandson calls him, Papa, Papa. I'll say, hi, how are you doing, Papa? He wants his Papa. He's, he adores Thomas, but all of the grandkids adore Thomas. So I wanted to wish my husband a happy Father's Day. Um, I, we've been it's going on 40 years. Don't, I, I know I'm aging myself. We've been together for so long that uh, he, he's just an amazing dad. We've been through ups and downs with our own kids struggles, uh, you know, addiction. Um, but you know what, we get through it. And we, our kids are still will fight for our kids till the day we die, because that's how much we love our kids. So happy Father's Day to all of our dads. And uh, I just like to uh, close, let me see, we will recess now to close session, and we will reconvene the meeting after closed session to hear a report from closed session and to a during the meeting, I don't know. I didn't write this. I think it's a repetitive, but thank you. We adjourn, we're going to adjourn the meeting now. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. We're not done. Okay. I would like to reconvene the meeting. No, 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 no. Okay. I would like to adjourn the meeting in memory of Officer Linnell Whitfield, Tung Thang Nguyen, and Arnold Holdren. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Council, and audience. I will now read the closed session items. Item 17 is Conference with Legal Counsel, Existing Litigation, Government Code Section 54956.9D1. The name of the case is Arcadia et al. versus Southern California Edison Corp., Santa Barbara Superior Court Case Number 20, CV02026. And item 18 is Conference with Labor Negotiators, Government Code Section 54957.6. Agency designated representatives, city manager and labor negotiator Colin Tanner, employee organizations are Santa Fe Springs City Employees Association, Santa Fe Springs Firefighters Association, and Santa Fe Springs Executive Management and Confidential Employees Association.
Meeting adjourned. Hey, no, no. No. We need no. a report out for um, Madam, Madam Mayor, Council, uh, in closed session, direction was given to staff and no reportable action was taken. Meeting adjourned. Yeah.